we kind of cut in. Um, okay. And if you can start with a short introduction of yourself, tell us a little bit about um, your background in teaching and what you've been doing over the over your career. Okay, so hello, um, my name's Hugh Della. Uh, I'm a teacher and teacher trainer and course book writer, uh, currently based in North London. Um, I've been teaching and been involved in English language teaching since 1993. Right. Um, initially, I was working in private language schools in the UK and then in Jakarta in Indonesia. Um, and then I came back to the UK in the kind of late 90s, did my Delta, did my MAT Sol and started writing course books. Um, I've been involved in course book writing since 2000, so 20 years now. Right. Um, for a long time, I was working in the EFL department at University of Westminster until all the non all the union members were made redundant. Um, they kept a couple of people on. Um, and since then, I've basically been self-employed, um, running a company called Lexical Lab and a website called Lexical Lab. And we do a mixture of different things. We do online language courses. We do uh, a summer school in London when we can, when there's no coronavirus crisis yeah. going on. Do quite a lot of overseas training, um, still write course books and do a lot of kind of traveling and training and conferences and things on the back of all of that as well. Um, our main course book series have been Outcomes with National Geographic Learning. Oh, I know Outcomes, yeah, right. Before that, we did a series called Innovations. I've also been involved in this Roadmap series with Pearson, and we've done a methodology book called Teaching Lexically. And Which I see over your shoulder. Uh, oh, yeah, con conveniently placed for a bit of product placement <laughs> Brilliant. in the okay. background. <laughs> okay. yes. That wasn't intentional, actually. But... <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Look, I want to spend, uh, I think, most of the time talking about the, the, the writing side of what you do. Um, okay. I'm interested in some of the books that you've produced, and uh, there's a few things we can talk about there, I think. Um, and also, uh, we'll talk about your lexical lab project as well um, okay. but I'm, I'm quite interested in the beginning of your career um, yeah. as you've just described it so you started teaching in the UK where yes. obviously most people get into this line of work um, through the travel side of it right most people travel somewhere and they teach and then they they do or they don't decide to make a career of it so what got you into teaching in the first place um I guess in many ways it, it was a kind of accident and that I sort of drifted into language teaching through a, a series of, of lucky coincidences really. Um, I did English literature at university at Goldsmiths. Right. I graduated in 91 and I've been playing in a band all that time and was sort of my, my main focus was basically on music and okay. being involved in all of that and that all kind of died a death by the end of 1991 really for various reasons and uh, I split up with the girl I've been living with at the time sure. uh, and um, was at this sort of weird loose end in my life and I basically kind of decided that I wanted to go off traveling and just get out of London and get away from the, the circles I was mixing in at that point yeah right and a friend of mine who I had known through music arrived back in London in late 1992 and we met up for a drink and I said I haven't seen you for ages where have you been and he told me he'd been in Iran and Ethiopia oh, wow. and at this point in my life this, this just seemed so ridiculously impossible and exotic and it was like how yeah. can anyone I know from from my world possibly have done this and he told me that he'd become a teacher and I was like okay bizarre and he asked me what my plans were, and I said I was thinking of maybe going traveling. And he said, well, don't be daft, do a CELTA course first. Right. And I sort of said, I've got no interest in teaching, really. I hated most of my teachers when I was at school. And I Yeah, was, right, okay. Why would I want to do that? And he said, look at, look at it as a form of revenge against the bad teachers. You've had. <laughs> okay. And this sort of like appealed to me, and I was like, oh, interesting idea. Uh, and so basically on the back of that, I, I did six months working in a pub. I saved up some money. I did a CELTA course. And okay. yeah, initially I was working in the UK because I was in, a, in another relationship that ended badly after that. Um, and after that, I just thought, you know what? I need to just, just go and do some, see the world. Right. And so I, I didn't want to go to Europe because I traveled around Europe a lot when I was playing music. And I wanted to kind of go somewhere far away and very different. 
Yeah. And there were lots of jobs going at that point in Asia, and I applied for a whole bunch of jobs, and the first one that I got offered was in Indonesia. So I hopped on okay. a plane and found myself in Jakarta. Okay. Um, after about six months of working in the UK. Right, okay. That was somewhat yeah. similar for me, actually. I chose, uh, so I'm in Indonesia as well, I chose Indonesia, um, similar to you, specifically because it was far away. It would have been a lot easier for me to go to Europe, Spain or Italy, um, and that's yeah. what people do. Spain was the, the one that came up, of yeah. course. Um, but what I realized was it was easy to go there. It would also be easy to come back if I didn't immediately like it. And I wanted to put yeah. myself in a position where I'd be somewhat stranded. It wouldn't be so easy for me to just kind of yeah. give up and come back. Um, yeah, so Indonesia was about similar. as far away as I could possibly be. <laughs> uh, so somewhat similar. Yeah, yeah. What kind of yeah. music were you playing here? Oh God, um, we were like a kind of garage R and B okay. blues oh, punk kind of band. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I still play. Um, you I do, stopped yeah. for twenty years in the middle of it all. Did you, you ever know, so. bring your guitar into the classroom? Oh no, God forbid! No. No, I, like to, I like to keep my two worlds very separate. <laughs> Good move, you know. I think. Wise move. Good. There's there's quite enough kind of aging Tefl gurus. Yeah, who don't know it's a bit of a trope, I think, isn't it? Music. Yeah. It's like, no, two very separate yeah. worlds for me. Good one. Know. Good move. <laughs> uh, so you did the Celta before you travelled. The Celta is a pretty high course. I uh, I started uh, with a pretty entry level Tefl certificate. Okay. Um, and did a Trinity much later on. But in fact far later than I, by the time I did it, I didn't really need it, to be honest. Uh, yeah. But the, so you took the CELTA at the beginning. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, see Tefla as it was back then, technically. Yeah, right, okay, so still yeah. in the early days, yeah. So that yeah. must have been, that must have set you up pretty well uh, at the beginning of your teaching. Um, yes and no. Um, it gave me the kind of very basic foundation upon which to build i guess and it gave right. me confidence to blag it and fake it for right. the yeah. early years of my career but i mean looking yeah. back at it now i think i was actually fairly poorly prepared and right, okay. i think I, I you know much as i was an enthusiastic and energetic teacher in my early years i don't think i was a good teacher right uh, yeah, i don't I really think i knew enough about what i was doing or you know, not enough about the language, not enough mm -hmm. about kind of what I was trying to achieve and what were desirable outcomes. I think I was just kind of surviving day by day, right. really. And I think looking back at it now, I regret that I wasn't better in my early years because I could have learned a lot more about the people I was interacting with. Yeah, okay. As it was, I was just kind of learning, could they say three trees and could they use Yeah, right, right, right. Correctly? Quite superficial. You know, yeah. It was quite okay. superficial. Okay. And, I, and then, you know, I think that was probably down to the, the, the intensity of the course and the fact that it's, it's, yeah. it's a one month initial preparatory certificate. Yeah, right. And, sure. Yeah. You know, but that's predicated on the assumption that you then get training in house wherever you go. And um, yeah. as most people bold know, assumption to make, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it doesn't often happen, you know. No, no. Right. OK. And then you later did the Delta as well, you said. So you, you and returned MA, to the UK well, for your yeah. Delta and the MA. Yeah. So that's. Uh, the Delta alone is a huge step up from the... It is, I've yeah. not done it yet. Right, okay. It is. And, I mean, I, although even there, again, I think, you know, that it's, I often think it's a bit like doing a proficiency course where people who've done Cambridge proficiency, as you're coming up to it, you feel like, because it's the last Cambridge exam, you feel like, yeah. this is it. There's no you way. Know, it's yeah, the yeah, end. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then, I actually, see. once you get past proficiency, you realise it was actually just the end of the beginning and that there's a whole yeah, level of linguistic competence okay, that you go on to. Yeah, yeah. And I think with the Delta, I, I ended up feeling, when I first got the Delta, I was like, that's it, I'm finished. I'm done. <laughs> I am the master. Oh, no, I am the <laughs> final <laughs> product. <laughs> right, but actually, yeah. I think for me, that was really the beginning of me starting to become a fully sentient teacher in a way. Okay, good. Um, yeah. And after that, I started really kind of, because I read so much in such a short period of time. Yeah. And I was kind of, you know, it was like a year of just reading and thinking, talking about teaching nonstop, obsessively. Yeah, right, right. And that took time to kind of go down and, and be digested. And I yeah. think out yeah. of that, I started really developing myself as a, as a more principled kind of teacher. Right, and, okay. Then eventually trainer. Um, okay. But it took me a long time to get to that stage, you know. I, yeah, I would say yeah. I've been, you know, in the machine kind of seven, eight years before I started. Yeah, right, to, I think. Yeah. Okay, I've got some sense of what I'm doing now. 
yeah yeah and i think it, it yeah it's an introspective journey to to go on if you like um and i i do think it's also a a, a career or an industry let's say um where a lot of people never actually get to that stage because it's mm -hmm. quite easy to float around the the TEFL world without ever without ever going that far. I think you know you yeah. can move country to country and school to school and just kind of stay at that uh, that same fairly superficial level. I think you can get away with that for a long time. Yeah, and and I think that's also why a lot of people burn out and get fed yeah. up and go off and do something else because yeah. they never really reach a way of teaching that they find sort of emotionally fulfilling. Yeah, meaningful. Steps. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you might be right about that. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, they spend ten years kind of getting students to talk about what the difference is between Jane left when Kevin arrived, Jane <laughs> yeah, was right. leaving when Kevin arrived, yeah, and Jane right. left when Kevin arrived. Yeah. Uh, and it can all feel a little know, bit algebraic kind of. that, yeah you know 10 years of doing that you just feel like when does my real life begin <laughs> right, sure. yeah and yeah. so unless unless you kind of work out a way to go beyond that i think it can it can be something which seems quite quite trivial quite juvenile quite kind of yeah yeah you know trite yeah. Yeah, so, like it, it's just an extended gap year, right? It's just a gap year that basically. never ends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then, after you did the Delta, uh, was it uh, from from your initial description? Was it then quite quick that you got into writing? Yeah. So when I was doing my Delta, I met a Kiwi guy called Daryl um, Hocken, okay. who uh, had been living in the UK, who was living in the UK at that point, and. We both read the Michael Lewis book, The Lexical Approach. Okay. And were very sure. kind of blown away by it and right. spent a lot of time trying to sort of digest it and think about it. And we were reading stuff about spoken language, discourse analysis, spoken and written language, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we both really just started thinking, well, there's not much out there that's really written from this perspective. So why don't we start trying to make our own lessons? And to begin with, it really was just, you know, making our own lessons that we could use in right. our teaching practice and that we right. could take into class. And from that, we basically realized that we had this kind of embryonic proposal that we could put forward to publishers. Yeah. And so I remember reading an article in ELTJ, the English Language Teaching Journal, um, about how to put forward proposals to publishing companies and so we kind of copied that to the letter and sent off our proposal uh -huh. in maybe 97, something like that, you know, sort of when I finished my Delta. And from that very quickly, we ended up with this publishing deal. Um, Cause I guess right. we were kind of very much first wave of lexical right. approach influenced writers. So right, you know, okay. lucky play, lucky time in a way. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, that, I just realized I never actually thought about it. So I've read the lexical approach. It's obviously, you know, you kind of have to right it's the yeah. it's one of the seminal works but i never realized uh, i never thought uh, did michael lewis make textbooks he didn't do instructional material right just the just the very theory. very little um he did do a book called out and about which was one of the oh, very okay. early kind of published things by language teaching publications which bombed um, oh, okay. but was that lexically or was that in line with his lexical approach though yes but i think where we you know in a way what was great about what Michael did from my point of view was he was good at talking about theory, was good at talking yeah. about ways of thinking about language and ways of looking at language, was much less good at really thinking about what that meant in classroom terms and what yeah. that meant in terms of material. Yeah, I so, mean, even the book, his, his book, his first book is very... It's not the most accessible, considering it's written in quite plain language. It's not. It's, it's not, not scientific, I mean, it's quite, but it's 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 not the most accessible of. Uh, no, of I mean, I, I kind of read it about three times when I first. Yeah. First yeah. Kind of, yeah. You know, it's like, what? you know, you've got all the little sidetrack stuff about right, Karl yeah. Popper and right, Stein, exactly, right, right, right. You know, the meaning of meaning and all of that stuff, and it's like right. that's really not written for your average twenty-four-year-old classroom practitioner. That yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I also um, think a lot I, of people that talk about have, the lecture. Sorry, about, no, sorry, yeah. No, I also think that, that it's such a central thrust now in, in modern EFL at least, that I think most people are using the lexical approach or, or at least claiming to use the lexical approach probably without having read it, right? I don't think, I think it's not, it's not often read. It's, it's, it's applied more than the book is read, I think, right? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I guess it becomes like those kind of cult albums or cult Yeah, movement, something like that, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> only 34 people bought it on its release yeah. date. Yeah, yeah. Gone on yeah. to influence thousands. That's right, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so when yeah, you then yeah, started yeah. writing your, your instructional material, um, yeah. um, heavily, it was sort of heavily influenced by that then. But was there, yeah, a, very much was so. there a big gap between what that, I mean, how much of that made its way into your, into your early work then? Was there a, a big part, modification or you'd say a lot, yeah? No, very little, I would say. Um, I mean, the very first book we did was, well, I've actually got a copy there, look, there it is. It, it, was, it was that, which was um, oh, okay. the very yeah. first innovation. It looks of its time, very much so, yeah. <laughs> got, it's yeah, got that cover, right? that cover up, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was with Michael Lewis and Jimmy Hill with LTP. Um, so okay. we were working quite closely with them. And Jimmy in particular had kind of quite a strong influence on shaping the material. Um, yeah, I, I think it was it was kind of close to what we wanted to do. Um, yeah, okay. You know, looking back at it now, there are all kinds of bits that I think wouldn't do it that way again, not convinced. Right, sure, of course, yeah. I mean, but I, I think in a way yeah. what we managed to do with innovations was to, because it was so left field for its time when it first came out, it's one of those books that I think a lot of people used initially and it kind of shocked them into a realisation about how little spoken language was generally focused on, yeah. um, how badly we generally teach Lexis, how badly yeah. we generally think about what's useful for the classroom, what's normal, what's natural. And I think as a result, yeah, in some small way, it's helped to shift the kind of internal debate within publishing, which impacts upon what teachers do, right. much more towards that kind of, we need to take spoken language seriously and we need to take right, vocabulary okay. seriously. I mean, I still right. think personally, there's a long way to go with that. Yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah. Publishing. Yeah, I think we'll talk more about that because I think that's definitely the case. But I'm, I'm very intrigued now because I realize, again, these are things I've not really considered. You're, this came after you had done the Delta, right? Yes. So after you'd done the Delta, you then kind of got into this way of thinking and you produced yeah. that first book. So was the Delta at that time, this is obviously going back a few years now, was the Delta at that time not very lexically? Because now, because I do ah. Thesol, and you, you kind of, Thesol is now almost synonymous with the lexical approach. It's, it's sometimes done well and sometimes done not so well, but was that not always the case then? Was that? No. So, I mean, what you have to bear in mind is the, the book, The Lexical Approach, came out in 1993. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And the first year it appeared on the reading lists for Delta was 95. And right, I did okay. my Delta from 95 to 96. So right, we were literally right. like the, first, the first year right. globally to have that on the course. Yeah. yeah. And at the time, I think, it, that there wasn't really even an acknowledgement of the fact that it represented a different way Such of conceptualizing shift, yeah. language right. or thinking about how we approach language. Right. It was just kind of, there's this book that's been causing a stir, we'd better stick it on the reading list and maybe wow. you can refer to it in your vocab essays. Yeah. You know, it, it really wasn't something that I think had particularly filtered down into the into the kind of foundations of the, of the, the, the courses at that point. Yeah, okay. Well, so, yeah, I never, I, obviously I'm, I, I know when the book came out and I know there was yeah. a time before the lexical approach. <laughs> the, you know, the, 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 the world of TESOL and PEFL and EFL now is almost synonymous with that approach. I can't even, yeah, yeah I, it seems like it must have just been a different thing entirely before, before that moment, that change. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Okay. So then uh, you presumably enjoyed the process of writing that, that writing yeah, that first much. book you, yeah? yeah. So what was that much. process like for you? And uh, like how, how intensively were you working on that? And did that sort of, how did that affect your career and, and your, your work at the time? Yeah, very intensively is the answer to that. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I kind of learned a fair few things from the process. When we were initially touting around our early lessons um, and looking for a deal, when we got approached by OUP and we went up for an interview at OUP and they were very interested in the fact that we were like these young teachers who had ideas about lexically oriented material, but they basically insisted to us there was no market for that kind of book. And right. you know, pushed, literally in the meeting, pushed the proposal to one side <laughs> okay. and offered us another proposal 
At which point, oh. Daryl, the guy I was working with, just basically kind of went, I'm out of here, yeah, and wow, stormed okay. out of the room. And Good. I had to kind of make my apologies and say, I don't think <laughs> whatever that proposal is, we want to write this book. And then LTP phoned us up and basically said, you know, we won't sell anything like as much as the other big publishers, but we'll be able to help you write a book that will be okay. much more where you're coming from and that will have an impact in a way. So we deliberately took the kind of non-commercial route, um, which, I, you know, looking back, I think was for the best personally. Yeah. Um, and I think it allowed us to do something much closer to what we'd hoped to do. I think we also learned that when we first started working with Jimmy in particular, who was much more hands-on than Michael was, um, Jimmy sort of went, there are some really interesting lessons, but where's the umbrella? And we sort of looked right, at him okay. and went, what are you talking about, the umbrella? And it's like, well, these are just individual lessons. How does this cohere as a whole thing? How does it become a methodology, what? yeah. And how does it, how does one lesson thread into the next and how do right, we okay. interweave and, okay, okay. you know, where are the kind of interwoven connected threads to this that stops it just being a series of one-off lessons? Right, okay. And at that point, we were sort of like, <laughs> not sure I understand the question even. And so I learned a lot from that and it was intensive. I mean, I would say the first book we probably spent almost two years working on I was working 30 hours a week teaching in St. Giles in London and then later doing actually a lot of EAP at that point. I worked at a university, Roehampton University, and then I was working at the University of Westminster. And all through that time, kind of writing a lot as well. And, you know, just, just newly married as well at that point. Yeah, wow. Well, so um, so you know, my wife probably yeah. didn't see me as much as she was hoping to. Yeah. And yeah, it was full on. I mean, I was working, I'd get right. up early, I'd work weekends, I'd, you know, sit late in the evening working. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know, I was like 29, 30 at that point. Sure, so, sure. You know. so I'm, I'm still interested in some of the, the mindset behind some of this. So two things that come to my mind. Uh, first of all, in line, in fact, with that question about, you know, being asked about the umbrella and the, the, the connectivity of it all. Um, yeah obviously you had this idea of a, of a methodology based on the lexical approach that you wanted to incorporate into teaching. Um, yeah. But you didn't, you didn't necessarily, most teachers don't really have a background in course design, yeah, which is obviously from what you've said is what, what seems to have been lacking. So how did you then overcome that? Did you get somebody else to fill that, to do that before you, or did you have to suddenly learn a lot about course design or what? The, the latter. Um, right, okay. <laughs> basically I think, I think a lot of teachers make their own material for different lessons. Okay. Yes, and they exactly have right. Yeah. Interesting yeah. little one-off lessons yeah, that work. That's right. And what they maybe don't think about is how you recycle language across the course, yeah, right, exactly. how you start to develop a coherent sense of what you want students to be thinking about and looking yeah. for, you know, how are you presenting vocabulary? Is there yeah. a kind of principled coherence behind the way yeah. you're dealing with yeah. vocabulary? Yeah. What messages are you sending to your students and your teachers through the way? I think it's also that thing of when you first start writing material yourself, you're writing it for yourself in your own classroom. Yeah, and, and then suddenly you've got a, an audience. Yeah, yeah, and then you give right. it to another teacher to teach, and they kind of take it into the class. <laughs> I can yeah. use it, and yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. understand what yeah. you wanted me work. to do with yeah. it. Yeah, right, absolutely. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you're like, how can that not work? That's my best uh -huh. lesson. Yeah. yeah, and so I think learning to write for other teachers that you didn't know and that you hadn't met was really yeah. difficult. Yeah. And to do that, you need a good editor. I mean, sure. and I think you know, in a way, this is what I worry about with kind of where we are now with, with, with the, the world of publishing, which is so much stuff is published online and it lacks, you know, some of it's great, but it lacks that kind of rigorous process that you yeah. go through with work in publishing where it goes through an editor, sometimes two or three editors, it goes through a piloting process, you get feedback on it, you draft it, you redraft it, you re-re-redraft yeah. it. Sure. And it's, it's quite heavily worked. And so a lot of it was just that, a lot of it was going through that process of learning the ropes and kind of expanding our understanding of what we were doing as we were doing it really yeah okay a lot okay. of long discussions with the editors and sometimes kind of going away feeling quite crestfallen thinking yeah oh, i can imagine we can't do this yeah you know and then 
that that also i mean that's the other thing i wanted to ask and that you've kind of you nailed into it there as well uh at 29 and fresh off yeah. the delta and you know you know sort of x number of years into your career how sort of confident were you about i mean so i do i do uh training now and i've not written a book yet but you know i i i imagine that one day i might as we as we do you know um but i like to think that some of the training that i do and some of the methodology that i present is stuff that i've come up with um yeah. they they ideas that are unique to me and the you know uh, the content that i've written but I always feel a little bit, who am I to be introducing these, you know, these ideas along, along comes me. Uh, did you have that, a sense of that? I mean, uh, uh, you know, relatively young and a, a, a very new idea in the field. Did you feel like uh, it was just kind of, uh, yes did you have any no. other sense? Yeah. I mean, I think we think we had two probably competing sets of feelings going on. One of which was, um, there's a lot of rubbish out there and we're going to come along and change all of that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I know that know, <laughs> the arrogance of youth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was definitely a lot of that going on. So in a sense, I think, you know, I, I don't think we were lacking in self-confidence. But at the same time, I think there was a kind of naivety about how the whole system worked, about how publishing worked, yeah. about how the international book market worked about about how change actually occurs within within a within a I, I don't think at that point we had any real sense of what the global ELT market really was even though we yeah. both worked overseas and things sure you know I mean when I was working in Jakarta I was working with other native speakers none of whom were particularly well qualified yeah. um, I didn't really even understand the the, the reality of Indonesian teachers of English working in contexts sure. around me. It just yeah, wasn't a right. world I was in. Right. Let alone, you know, what's happening in Chile or what's happening in state schools yeah, in Russia sure. or what are they doing in the Volga schoolers in Germany? I, I just yeah, had right. no no awareness of any of that. And you know, there's there's no way you could do really if you're not right. in, in, a, in a situation where you have to inter interact with those realities. So I think there was a lot of confidence born from the feeling of doing something groundbreaking and doing something new. And I think we, we knew that that's what we were doing. Right. At the same time, I think there was also a lot of naivety about what, 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 what was achievable. And I mean, yeah. now that a couple of years ago, I was with Michael Swan and he was doing his kind of farewell tour. And um, he came up to me after one of my talks and basically said very kindly, I've always enjoyed watching you talk. And um, it's lovely to see someone talk about language keep doing what you're doing, but I should warn you, they don't bloody listen. <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah I know, I know. Yeah. Like, I've been saying the same thing for 40 years. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, if you're lucky, time, a few people listen. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. you know, you, you become much more realistic about what, what's possible to achieve as you get yeah. older. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've already... So you achieve nothing. Yeah, that's, I, think, I think I've already begun to realize that i mean i still have I, I mean i imagine for you even now you still harbor some of those grandiose dreams right oh, you yeah. must have, no, there must course, be, and i think i still do but i've realized i think you kind of you develop a little bit of a kind of a contingent of a following of people who get on board um but you're not going to change the world the way you once yeah. hoped you you would I, I think i get i get what you're saying there as well yeah and i guess as you go on you have to make your own peace with what compromises you're prepared yeah. to make and what compromises yeah. you're not yeah you know yeah. and that really impacts on where you end up going in a sense yeah 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 i think i'm still that's that's kind of where i am now perhaps is beginning to uh, reluctantly have to accept some of that yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. comes to all of us you know just, yeah, just sure. don't accept too much would be my advice good yeah no i'll uh, i'll take that one you, on know, board. You, you, you still want to be able to look the 25 year old version of yourself in the eye when you're 50, yeah you know? right right um, right that's yeah. important i think yeah i said i certainly i i look around at other not necessarily just teachers and trainers and what uh the, there are certainly um levels of integrity around the industry and there are certainly people who hold on to some of that a little bit firmer than others i think i'd like to i'd like to be able as you say to look myself in the eye where that's concerned yeah. um, I mean, i've seen people give plenary speeches where i think well that's completely in contradiction to what you do in your own material <laughs> you right talk, okay talk to them afterwards and you kind of say well what you were talking about and what you do in your books how, how does that work 
and they'll yeah. kind of say, well, there are my principles, and then there's my practical, you know, need yeah, right. to make a living. So I, I, right. I can't, I can't, I can't yeah, do no, that. I just, yeah, no, no I, that, that's, yeah, I couldn't do that. I, I, I turn down quite a lot of, uh, uh, in, in fact, in fact, what a strong example of that is just plenary talks in general. I don't do anymore um, because I like to be practical and I like to engage with with you know an audience on a on a more of a workshop format. And I yeah. stopped doing seminars a few years ago, um, and I started. I'll accept them now as long as it's under the caveat that I will come and move people around and you know put people in groups. And if they'll allow yeah. me to do that, then I'll take it. But yeah, 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 seminars yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I see people talking about you know, student centered learning and practice. And then, they, but they're standing in a room of 500 people. <laughs> you can't yeah, 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 yeah. All yeah. nodding going, yes, we yeah. believe it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. I know, I know. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's, there's a tension, there's that tension's, I think, difficult to navigate, definitely. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the, some of the naivety you had early on about the industry and yeah. the restrictions that, that, that are um, imposed by that industry the global markets and the yeah. publishing format you also referred to kind of open resources on the internet and, and some of that um do you see much of a future for kind of breaking free of the publisher model and some of those restrictions by going online do you think it's possible to do that and maintain the quality what do you think about that? i mean you've you've got an online you're doing something online now is do you see that as kind of moving away from the the traditional format or what so I mean, I think in terms of the restrictions that get imposed on you, there's certain things like, you know, I mean, with innovations, what we did was, I think, freer and and much more focused on spoken language than what we ended up doing with outcomes. Um, right, okay. And in a way, with outcomes, we've had to take on board the more traditional grammar syllabus that's expected of an international course. Should so... You know, if left to my own devices with things like the advanced level book, I'd have hardly any grammar in it at all because I just don't right, think okay. it's an issue. But mm. I recognise that, you know, there, there's a kind of, you, you negotiate the tensions that the market imposes upon you and you right. try to deal with that in the best ways that you can. I guess for me personally now at this stage of where I'm at, I mean, I've done two five, six level course book series. And right. so you develop a reputation for what you can do on the back of that body of work okay i think in terms of breaking free yes there's obviously a possibility to do that online the problem is it's very very difficult to compete with the big players if you don't have a huge startup play sure okay sure. so a few years ago a bunch of us who all, all write course books met for a drink at a conference after i tepple and we sort of discussed we, we could try and do a self-published course book online, okay. you know, mm -hmm. we get talking about it and we've got the brains and we've got the creative. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It's not the virus. Um, <laughs> we've got the, we've got the know-how and we've got the, 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 the creatives there. We could write a course book. We could probably get it recorded. Um, we could probably access pictures for it. We could get it delivered digitally, but how the hell do we sell it globally without right. the reach of an international publisher? Sure. Okay, and you know, you, you start to think about the re even using the internet and being quite tech savvy and, and marketing savvy, your reach is much, much smaller than the reach of a big publishing company. So, you know, yeah. what you have to remember is things like Pearson or National Geographic Learning or you know, Oxford University Press or whatever, they've been around a long time and they've got tendrils everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're big organisations with big marketing arms and a big budget for marketing. Yeah. Um, so I think what you can do, and, you know, it's something we've talked about my, ourselves, Andrew and I, is you can do the kind of self-publishing model. You can write your own materials that you can deliver through a kind of, you know, subscription model or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a market for that if you have a reputation already within the right. field. Sure. Um, you've still got to deliver, you know, one or one, say, a lesson a week, deliverable at two different levels, you know, the, the right. intermediate yeah. version and the course, advanced yeah. version. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to work out how to be able to kind of market and deliver that you could probably do that and get say a couple of hundred subscribers that would sign up to you and want right, those lessons. Right, right. Um, 
it's still small scale compared to you know in a way you're preaching to the converted all the time and yeah that's yeah that, right. that's I lovely that, yeah sure with a course book that's out there in the world it years ago when i was first starting to write course books i read an article as part of my ma um from eltj again about the course book as agent of change and okay. it had never really occurred to me that one of the things that course books could do was to kind of impact upon the you know be, be a large wave that contributed towards ripples that affected some kind of sea change within the industry yeah and okay. i think thinking about the course book as something which is both mainstream and usable on a global scale but also which contributes to a change in yeah the way in which people conceptualize what course books are there for maybe yeah you know sure. it's it's you have more impact that way i think sure and so you know ideally we'd like to carry on being able to work on the outcome series and develop that okay. um, so that's a, has to be a very iterative process i assume because you can only get the publisher to step forward so much and then yeah. that has an impact and then they can go, okay, now we can push a little bit farther. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, there's also, I mean, we turned down more work with other publishers. Right. Simply. Okay. It's just like, yeah, of course we could write that and the money would be nice, yeah. but I just, I just I don't like the idea. Yeah. And yeah. with outcomes, I mean, the, the, the big difference with outcomes was in a way it was our brainchild. It was kind of something we came up with and we yeah, took right. to the publishers and we right. sold to them. And I right. think the vast majority of books that come out are driven by focus groups and yes, publishers' sure, desires, sure. and they are <clears throat> written by people who are happy to take on those contracts because they don't have a kind of ideological axe of yeah, their own to just grind. Job, and right. I think, yeah, you know, we've got too much of an ideological axe yeah, to yeah, grind yeah, to want yeah. to do too much of that. Yeah, no, I get that. So when you when you brought outcomes then to uh, Nat Geo, um, yeah. which is a happy coincidence. I want to, if we can talk a bit about Nat Geo, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I want to, yeah. But uh, so when you did that initially, you were shopping that around to a few publishers and it was Nat Geo that bit or how did that happen? No. So what happened was with LTP, we did the first innovations and then I think we did three more levels of innovations initially or one more level maybe with, with LTP. And then LTP, basically at the turn of the century, Michael and Jimmy were, were looking to sell up and just to get out of the game. Um, okay. Michael particularly was very, very untech savvy and untech interested. He said he came back from a conference in about 1999 where everyone had been talking about the internet and Michael was just like, I'm done, I'm Turned not off, interested. Yeah, right, I want to okay, learn this wow. stuff. Okay. You know, and I mean, it's interesting because there are no <laughs> videos of him out there. There's no videos of right, him talking. Right, yeah, right, right, of course. Yeah. You know, there are these sort of legendary stories of Michael's appearances <laughs> at IFFL that some of us witnessed, but there's right. nothing, nothing digitally. Uh, and I think he very consciously decided to sell up when he realized that was where things were heading. Mm. They touted LTP around, and the company that bought them initially were, what were they at that point? Cengage Learning. Yes, Cengage, Boston. right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of went as part of the furniture to Cengage Learning I see, okay. when they bought the LTP brand. Okay. And they sort of went, well, we like this book. Let's expand it into a series. So right. we turned yeah. the innovations into a kind of five level series with Cengage. Right. Well, they kind of kept changing their name. They were like Cengage, Cengage and Learning, Henley, Cengage, Thompson, yeah, Heinle, right. yeah. Cengage, yeah. Heinle, right. Cengage, Thompson Learning. I could yeah. never remember what we were supposed to say we were who we were supposed to say we were working for <laughs> yeah, from year to year. The company formerly known as Symbol. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And then by the time we'd finished the five level series, they started talking about doing a second edition of innovations. And as we started on that, it became clear that actually that was going to be a different series. Right. And okay. so yeah. initially the second edition of Innovations Intermediate started. And that ended up becoming outcomes intermediate. Okay, I see. Okay. Which they kind of, we didn't tout it around at all. Um, right. They okay. were like, we wanted to take this and turn it into our new general English series, right. which will sell alongside innovations. Right. Um, okay. And so we thought, yeah, yeah, why not? And then yeah. from that, they eventually kind of morphed into National Geographic Learning because okay. five or six years ago, they bought the educational wing of Nat Geo Learning under the Thompson Heinle wing. I see. 
but as part of the deal, they had to keep the name National Geographic Learning, keep a lot of right. the branding. Right, so, which I think is a smart move, actually. I think that's smart move. You know, it's, 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 it's been really good for them, I think. Yeah. And it's so been I, great for kind of working with the archive of photos and all of that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, but, absolutely. You know. so that's one of the things So I didn't know initially before. <clears throat> Obviously, you and I have only been in touch <clears throat> quite recently. Um, and yeah. I didn't know before and before we did, before we started setting this call up, um, that you were working with Nat Geo. And uh, yeah. it happens that that's, <clears throat> well, I've, I've done training work with a number of publishers you know the, okay. the the usual suspect but um nat geo is the only one that i've actually kind of formally endorsed um huh? so i i really you like with the singapore office um so i the, they now have um a i'm still not i was never fully under they tried to explain these things to me and i never fully understood it but there is actually a local office here in jakarta yeah but they come underneath i think thailand um, okay. I and then you know there's kind of different levels of authority and different levels of autonomy. So I don't fully understand. But I was working with with the local office here in, uh, okay. in Jakarta, and occasionally somebody would come over from Thailand and I'd do something with them. Um, I was only I I, I was only ever um, third party. Uh, do some yeah, 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 yeah. But um, whereas with other publishers, I would go and do training and not really mention the book, you know, so they'd say, you know, here's the book that we're selling to the school and here's Carl to come and do some training and they are tenuously linked. Uh, Nat Geo yeah. was the only publisher that I really felt comfortable going in and talking about how I would use that book in my class because they are, they're, 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 they are very different. Um, and where I've always said in the past, you know, look, you pick up a book from this publisher, you pick up a book from that publisher, you flick through, they're, in, they're, they're kind of indiscriminate. I think the next. they also that benefit. Is... Sorry, Carl, go on. Yeah, no, I think they benefit from, 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 from being something. American in a way. Right, okay. I think we found as British authors that they're easier, you know, they do capitalism better in lots of ways. The British <laughs> right, yeah. publishers are very old school, very traditional, right. they're very public school. Um, yeah, right. uh, they're very kind of hierarchical and class bound. Okay, and, I quite stuck in the ways they do things. And I think with the Americans, they're much more open to people coming to them and pitching an idea and saying, look, I've got this okay. idea, what do you reckon? And they sort of go, hmm. Whereas the British lot just kind of go, that doesn't fit into our marketing right. plan and our system and we can't be doing with this. So we've we found them easier to work with on that kind of level because they're, they're more, they're more interested in investing in you as an author and as an asset to the company right, and as okay. someone who brings creative ideas to them than I think a lot of the big English publishers are. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'd never really thought about it from, from that angle, from that, uh, that, that direction, so that's interesting. They immediately you know, struck me as being very different. Yeah, Sorry right. again? You know, they just immediately struck me as being very different. I'd never yeah. seen books like this trying to do the things that they were doing. The, the first yeah. thing that uh, uh, stuck out to me was their focus on like critical thinking activities as, yeah. a, as a main focus of what they do, not some <laughs> yeah, yeah. implicit thing in the background. And I think they're, they're always interested in kind of, how can we bring a bit more innovation to the products that we're launching? Yeah, okay. you know, what, what, what is it that we're adding that's not there already? Yeah, um, yeah, it certainly looks so, that yeah, way. If you've got ideas on what you want to see in that kind of respect. They're very receptive to right, those ideas. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. So I wonder then, as I said, so my relationship with textbooks as a teacher has always been a very kind of loose one. Um, and there are a handful of books that I like, and I've, you know, I've got this series and that series, and uh, very rarely, even with the Nat Geo books that I that I really do like, uh, very rarely will I pick one book. That I'm going to use for a course um, and yeah. so I'll dip in and out of various books so I wonder what you think about that kind of obviously uh, you both you. from you right I wonder right so, <laughs> so from your both as a person who writes these books so when you write a book you must have quite a unified idea of this is the course it has a structure and then yeah. also there's the commercial side of things where you know it's your bread and butter what kind of a, what do you feel about this approach someone like i take where you know i mean i've paid for the books i've bought them i've got them on a bookshelf there but i don't use a book the way it was written and intended um what do you how do you feel about that what kind of thoughts do you have about that and and maybe what do you think about then the is it Krashen who has you know the the no book approach the dogme approach and these kind of maybe we should what what, what are your thoughts on all this so 
That's a lot of questions. Yeah, um, it is more than I thought, more than I, I realized. Go ahead. I, I understand where that comes from. Um, and I think when I was a younger teacher, I was very much of the pick and mix, mix and match kind of approach to taking material in. Um, obviously, as a writer, I, I kind of, I guess my issues with it are sort of not 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 purely selfish in a way um they're just kind of okay if that's what you're doing what are your overarching goals for the course right. and what outcomes are you trying to achieve and why do you feel that those outcomes are best achieved by doing it the way you're doing rather than using yeah. a unified course yeah and if you can sit there and explain that to me i kind of think fair enough you thought this through you've got some kind of I think when I was a younger teacher what I used to do was to kind of think oh god they need more grammar and I'd better find another vocab right. exercise sure. on this topic and sure. I've done the grammar presentation from this book so I'll do another grammar presentation from that book right, and I mean right, looking right. back at it now I think that was a very poor reason for doing the kind of mix and match that I was doing yeah, yeah. um I mean I think also obviously there is a there is a logical reason for choosing a course and sticking with it which is that yeah, okay. each course itself whatever you think of the course has its own kind of internal coherence yeah. and its own often covert kind of set of messages about what's important to focus on and what you want students and teachers to be yeah. focused to, to be learning yeah. uh, and teaching um that, that you know don't work if you're doing intermediate of one course book and then upper intermediate of another course book. Oh yeah, book. of course, yeah. They don't, yeah. don't dovetail no. in any kind of no. coherent way. No. As a writer, I mean, I know that what we're doing is from unit to unit and from level to level, there's a lot of recycling, there's a lot of implicit yeah. kind of making sure that language is re-exposed to students. Yeah. And, you know, I think if you're doing that from unit to unit, you get more out of it than if you're just doing a page here and a page there. Um, which isn't to say, I don't understand why people choose not to do that. Yeah, um, sure. It's just that I want to know what the principles behind not doing that are. That's yeah. all. You know, yeah. as I said, there, there may be a rationale that people have that that, that works for why they're doing yeah. that. Yeah. So have on, you heard on that level, I, one yet? Huh? Have you heard <laughs> one yet? <laughs> I'm open. I'm open to explanations. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean. Often, it's funny, I mean, I go into schools sometimes and they'll kind of say, we, we, we have our own materials bank that we use. And what they actually mean yeah. is a bunch of photocopied, photocopied laminated <laughs> things that they just whack through the machine. Yeah. Often photocopied like, from a book that they pirated oh, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, hey, I worked in Jakarta for, for years in the 90s, so I'm, I'm very aware of how the pirating industry yeah, yeah, works, yeah, you would say. Yeah. Um, I forgot what the last question was. Uh, I'll come back on that for a minute if I can then and then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try and defend myself um, but uh, yeah so I, I mean I agree with what you're saying actually and and although I still take the approach I do I completely agree with what you're saying and it's, oh, it's you're a strange one things, yeah I was yeah 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 so it's a strange one though because I, although I take this kind of uh, what I like to refer to as a library approach, like in a, you know, a, using multiple books, it's actually something I find difficult uh, uh, recommending to other teachers because it comes with a requirement for instructional design, which, as we mentioned earlier, the average teacher doesn't have. Um, and this yeah. is something I, I like to labor quite a lot. Um, I was asked quite recently, you know, as a teacher, what should I be doing to design a course? I said, probably nothing. You, know, you, you pick a course and follow it um, because a, a teacher doesn't isn't usually equipped with that. I because I've studied some instructional design and because I train it to other people, I feel a little bit more equipped to do that. Um, and, you know, I write syllabus of my own. And so I'm I'm a little bit more, you know, of course, I would say this, but I feel a little bit better equipped to pick materials in that you're way. not going to say it about yourself who is going to say it about you. <laughs> uh but I, I wouldn't i wouldn't even though i do that i wouldn't feel comfortable telling another teacher that they should do it without having the um the instructional design background that, that i think you need so a couple who, of quick points on that before yeah, we come back please, to the yeah, question go ahead. Talk, I think. yeah i think one is there's a lot of materials illiteracy and yes a lot exactly of right yeah a lot of people think just because they've used a course book a couple of times, they can make their own material. Yeah, right, and right. I absolutely wouldn't stop people from wanting to make their own material. I think it's an important part. Yeah, the creativity is important, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think you learn a lot about 
how materials work and you come to appreciate materials and sure. now materials are really hated working from in the 90s like headway i'm able <laughs> to look at and at least appreciate yeah. more the craft that i know yeah. has gone into sure. okay and you know it's like when you hear a song that you don't like, but you can recognise that there's something going on with it that's yeah, interesting, and you're like, absolutely, I hate yeah. that song, but my God, it's catchy. Yeah, you know yeah, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I, I can appreciate the craft that's gone into mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, and there must be as well, just to briefly try. I mean, because I was thinking this earlier. I mean, I said I like, for example, you know, the the books that you've worked on. It just happens. Uh, this was this is pure coincidence that that I'm talking to you now. It happens that those are books that I've that I've endorsed before. Um, but obviously, some of the other books that I find to be much you know, much old, more old fashioned, perhaps, or less effective one way or another. Obviously, there was somebody like you at the back of them somewhere, you know, with a with a unified idea and, a, and, a, yeah. and an ideology for writing them in, in most cases that that kernel of of, uh, of motivation was was obviously there for every series of book on, yeah. on some level, right? I, and I think it's useful for I mean, one of the things we do, and maybe you do as well, from the sound of it, on our own training courses is we do a course on materials development in the summer. Yeah. And a lot of it is really just getting teachers to become aware of what the kind of underlying ideologies yeah. are that yeah, drive right. material. And, yeah. you know, what, why is this double page the way it is? Yeah, exactly. What, yeah. What's no, I spent going several on sessions with teachers exercise? doing that. Yeah, good. Yeah. And I mean, I, I find it where, where I go and watch teachers. You, you said something earlier about the way in which course books were intended to be used. And mm. I think it's, it's, you know, one thing I've realized is teachers will use your material in radically different ways so right. i go and watch 10 teachers teach pages 42 and 43 of the intermediate book in 10 you different get ways 10 completely insanely right. different right. lessons right some of which you look at and go wow that was brilliant some of them you're just like why yeah. why sure. were you doing yeah. it like that <laughs> you know you'd see yeah. people who'd kind of invent their own 15 minute warmer that doesn't go anywhere at the beginning of the lesson yeah right yeah and then you'd yeah. ask why did you do that thing at the beginning i needed a warmer what yeah. do you think exercise one is <laughs> oh right. oh i hadn't yeah okay and you're like wow this is the level we're at where people are inventing their own add-ons to material simply because they don't actually understand sure. how the material yeah. itself works yeah and i think yeah. until you can kind of critically analyze and look at and understand the way published material works you're yeah. not really in a position to start creating your own material yeah. yet yeah i agree with that yeah good, good materials writing comes out of a critical ability to to, to understand and yeah. articulate what you think's wrong with other i think when we started yeah. writing it was very much driven by a frustration with published materials that we were very right. aware of and we were right. able to articulate our frustrations right. with. Yeah. So yeah, all of that. Yeah. The craft so then yeah, the, 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 yeah, go on, go on. Yeah. So I think with the dog may thing, um, the kind of, you know, your, your Scott Thornbury, let things develop organically kind of approach. I have some sympathy with that. Um, I think it was, invented and propagated by someone who's never taught 30 hours a week in the state system right um, yeah if you're teaching 30 hours a week and you're teaching classes of 30 students the idea that you go in and let the language <laughs> see what happens <laughs> yeah. bloody optimistic you know um i think yeah. there's a degree to which you know what what, what what used to be known as winging it has been yeah. rebranded slightly as dog I agree. And I agree. it's good to be able to do you know if you've if you've been out till five in the morning and you've slept two hours and you haven't got a lesson plan it's bloody good to be able to walk into a classroom and go right so uh, what and we're going also to do when, when you've planned a lesson and for whatever reason it just doesn't work you can't then yeah, plan and, and it goes well, off got nothing, right? you've got to be able to react to that and, yeah so i think Feel being the, yeah, able yeah. to listen to things that students are saying and think about how to help them say those things better is really really important and i wouldn't i want teachers to kind of get better at doing that themselves sure you yeah. know ra yeah. rather than just delivering the material to the students listen yeah. to your students and help them try to say what they're trying to say and when you do that it breaks a lot of things that you've been taught about teaching so you know you might yeah. be working with an absolute elementary class and they might try to say things like, you, how, how long you, you teach? How long teach you? How, how long yeah. teaching you? And you go, how long have I been teaching? Yes. And, you know, that student's ready to learn how long have you been teaching? Right, exactly right. Yeah. 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 
So I think all of that's really useful to be able to do as a teacher. Yeah. I think the problem with doing it all the time is it's incredibly demanding on you as a teacher. Sure. And ironically, yeah. it means that all of the input has to come from you. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. With yeah. the way I think, let the material carry some of the weight. Okay. Sure. If you know what material you're taking in, you can look at that material before you go into class. You can think about how you're going to explain it, what examples yeah. you might give of the problematic language, yeah. what questions you're going to ask about that vocabulary you're looking at. Yeah. If all of what you're doing is reactive and responsive, yeah. it's, I mean, I do it with our own lexical lab online classes. We basically teach advanced level students. We give them tasks that we want them to think about in advance. Okay, so we're doing a thing today about um, places you've been to. Okay, and it's things like, you're going to be talking about where you live. Think about how long you've lived there, what kind of place you live in, how you ended up there, who you live with, what it's like, what facilities you have, what you like most least about it, how it's changed. I have some idea of the kinds of things students are going to say. Right. I've already got some stuff in my head. But while I'm listening to the groups on Zoom, in our case, I'm also reacting and thinking about, yeah, yeah, I know what yeah, you mean. Of course, yeah, right. say it better. Yeah. And that's draining. It's draining. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to do 30 hours a week of that. Yeah, um, no, Because right. it's really, really demanding on me as a teacher. And this is something I've been doing for almost 30 years and I'm good at. For a right. young teacher, basically what you'll be able to do is correct a few grammar mistakes. Yeah. And, and maybe rephrase a couple of sentences. Yeah. And it's you have really to be to so well equipped with the subject matter as well, because anything yeah. can come out of left field. And what I've found, in fact, a conversation, so much of what we've talked about today is reminding me of a conversation I've been having online today, just a, a, a comment thread that I've been a part of online today um, about this lack of subject mastery that so many English teachers unfortunately have. That I, you I saw your comment on LinkedIn. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. walk into a classroom kind of, you know, half knowing the English grammar um, and then expect to let your t your students lead the the way of the because you don't know what questions they're going to ask and you won't be able to answer them so you're going to either be giving them no answers or bad answers. Um, so and, and you've got now, to be. I mean, I, mean I, I still get asked questions every lesson which I can't answer because they're really course. tricky. So I mean, right. last night I was teaching and one student suddenly said, "So Hugh, what's the difference between um, repercussions, implications, and consequences?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, I'll, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll try and keep it below 10,000 words. <laughs> so it's one of those questions where you have to go, even though I've been teaching 27 years, I need time yeah, course, to think yeah. about that one. Yeah, course, Let me look at some examples. Let yeah. me get back to you and I'll add back to the notes I'll send you after the class. Right, right, um, right. And so, you know, a lot of those questions I can answer because I've been asked them before. Like, you know, if a student says like, what's the difference between injury and wound or right, you know, yeah. greasy and oily i can do those yeah. without thinking yeah um because i've done those ones a lot you know what's the difference between get fired and get made redundant easy yeah right you know, Good, yeah. i know all yeah. of the extra language that i'll bring in when i'm teaching that stuff and i've got but if you if you've planned your lesson you can also predict which of those questions are going to be asked in that lesson. exactly right? you yeah. know exactly and I, and I think that's the real advantage of not just being reactive and having you know even now when i'm teaching if i'm teaching my own material um course books i've written myself that i know inside out yeah. i will still spend 10 minutes before i'm teaching looking at the language there and just thinking yeah yeah i better be on top of that little bit because yeah. that always yeah. comes up you know they're going to ask about yeah, it yeah right yeah, you know that yeah. you'll want to do something with that yeah. so it's much easier to do that if you've got the material before you go into the classroom and you've got space to think about and again, I think it's a different way of thinking about lesson planning. When I was a younger teacher, my lesson planning was all about strings of activities. And mm. now it's much more about what language are you going to be looking at? Yeah. What are you going How to do, you do get with there? that language? Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to explain it? You know, what examples are you going to give? What questions are yeah. you going to ask? What are you going right. to want them to do with that language right. afterwards? It's much more kind of the meat. Yeah, yeah. And you're yeah. more focused on the language. And I find that the more you focus on the language in the ways you've just, you've just described, uh, ironically, the less you end up focusing on grammar and yeah. structure, you know, explicit yeah. structure, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also, it, it's just kind of, 
it's recognizing that a hell of a lot of what students want to say isn't really to do with complicated grammar it, right. it's just to do with not knowing how to say things so i mean yeah. i'm just opening up a document here which came up yesterday okay that these are things that i rephrased for my class and it's things like okay. they've patched up the potholes for the time being Okay, uh -huh. you know, you can study the present perfect as much as you want. You're not right, exactly. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're going through a bit of a rough patch at the moment. We're having marriage <laughs> guidance counseling, yeah, yeah, just the present continuous. Yeah, Lots and that's it. I mean, I, the, the, I would just never teach that as a present continuous sentence, I would teach it as something the, that, a thing that you say, right? Study. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think you know, I've got this talk I'm working on at the moment, which is about what's grammar for. And I start by basically looking at all this language that I've taught, and it's either reformulations of things students have tried yep. to say, yep. or yep. it's examples of how to use vocabulary yep. that you've been looking yes. at. Yes, yeah, good, yeah. And good. what's interesting is when you look at it that way, the grammar's simple. It's like present continuous, present perfect. But the, the problem's not the grammar. The grammar's yep. all stuff they yep. learn at elementary and pre-intermediate. Right. The problem yep. is, how the hell do you say we're going through a bit of a rough patch at the moment and we're having <laughs> yeah. marriage guidance counseling? Yeah. Either yeah. you know that language or you don't. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know, just knowing the grammar doesn't help, you know, he is doing his homework, you are playing Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Watching it's, the TV. So do you think you nowhere close? Do you think that the reason so so much of the um the course book uh landscape is still oriented that way is because of market demand. I mean, you have been taking your approach for some years now and okay, on the one hand, we might say it's still new in kind of, you know, uh, geographical terms, it's a, it's a new thing, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's been around for a while now and there are, there are some well established textbooks and, and, and course books and people like Michael Lewis and things are well known. Why has it yeah. not had a bigger impact on the, on the industry? So I, I think there's three or four reasons for that. I think one is that there's a kind of, the, the, the success of the biggest selling global course books has a kind of tyrannical knock-on effect to the publishing right. industry. So for a long time that was headway and right. then that yeah. was English file, which yeah. I often kind of think of as being like a kind of headway redux mini me. It's sure. kind of like the grammar part of headway condensed to the max with a sort of stripped down minimal kind of vocab input uh -huh. and some laughs around the edges. Uh -huh. And so yeah, I think yeah. when you've got a book like that, that's been so incredibly successful, the conversation that publishers always have is, well, obviously we want this to compete with English file. Right. And the way they think about doing that is to kind of replicate as much of what English files done as possible yeah. with an added yeah. twist. And yeah, the conversation sure. we always have is like, it doesn't work like that. Like, you know, when the Beatles split up and people were thinking, what can possibly What's replace, gonna replace it? <laughs> yeah. No one, everyone was going to go four piece band. We need a four piece band. Yeah. Then you get David Bowie, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, no one nah, we didn't see that, that. coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, a bloke yeah. in a dress. <laughs> yeah. The focus groups didn't tell us this was what they wanted. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't um, even have two eyes the same color, let alone four piece <laughs> band. <laughs> and I think things often work like that, actually, that right, often, yeah rather than trying to give people what you think they think they want which yeah. is what happens in publishing so there's a lot right. of that yeah um yeah. there's a lot of you know this is what they've had before and they want something like this but slightly different and so mm -hmm. if you kind of go how about giving them something completely different that maybe they don't know they want but they want when they see it yeah you know, right you know yeah. giving the it's, it's the lord reith thing when the bbc started is um giving the people what they didn't know they wanted and yeah, I think good, yeah. for a long time the BBC did that and now a lot of what they do is well let's ask the focus group what they want and what the focus yeah. group will say is we quite like meat and two veg but can we yeah. have fewer potatoes yeah and so yeah. you get carrots and packed well, I, I always liked the quote from I, it must have been it must have been Henry Ford who said it uh, if we had asked the people what they wanted they would have asked for faster horses or something um and, you know, <laughs> exactly. car, yeah. right it's, so yeah it's, that's it's, it yeah uh, yeah. I think on top of that, there's also the other thing that maintained the status quo is grammar is still easier to test. It's still what yeah. forms the basis of a hell of a lot of state exams. Yeah. Um, 
it's also more easy to kind of unpack and package in terms of ticking off what you've done. So, you know, I'm sure you've had these students. Yeah, yourself. sure. I've done Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Legal photocopy <laughs> bootleg version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cool. tick, I've done the past yeah, perfect. Right, simple. Yeah. I've done the yeah, past perfect sure. continuous. And there's that idea that once you've kind of worked through these, these unpacked building blocks, that you've got the language and you've got the grammar. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you're talking about kind of, you know, learning things like we're going through a rough patch, well, there's, there's tens of thousands of those things. So there's this kind of fear of yeah. the vastness and the sort of the wild, untamable nature yeah. of the lexicon yeah. compared yeah. to the easily digested, presented, yeah. packaged, yeah. you know, grammatical was, syllabus that you have. Yeah, no, I agree. I always found a, a, a nice microcosm for that was uh, or is i should say um phrasal verbs or multi-word verbs where there's it's a con but all you can do is teach another one and another one and another one yeah, exactly. there is no rule yeah. or pattern that you can give yeah. to say now you know phrasal yeah. verbs you just you have just to learn, learn one, one next one, one and the next one yeah right yeah. yeah and i mean often when you get students who are sort of intermediate and above and they're, they're kind of like well how do i get better it's like you learn yeah, how does your indonesian get better I see. Go out and learn vocab. Some more the next day. Exactly right. Yeah. You learn the next exactly right. bit of vocab, and then the next bit of vocab, and then yeah. and then you realise, oh, I've been saying that bit wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and know, it's always and just as well because I didn't because I didn't take classes. What what I'm always trying to achieve in the classroom with my students is, um, you know, when I learned Indonesian, it was because I didn't know how to say something. Right? I wanted to say something that I didn't know how yes. to express. I wanted to achieve yeah. something in a conversation. So that's the next thing I have to learn. And so what you will learn, I mean, this is this had a huge impact on the way I thought about learning language as well, is what I realized very quickly when I was learning Indonesian was I was learning two things. I was learning things that people said to me that I didn't understand. Yeah. You know, where I'd get a friend and I'd kind of go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, or, or I'd learn how to say things that I wanted to say. Yeah. So I'd ask ask other friends like how do you say you know yeah. what are you up to this weekend or right. just whatever and I wasn't learning things that course books were giving me that I didn't want to say you know it was all kind of exactly what you said and how do I say the next thing I wanted to say yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. when you learn like that what you realize is normal conversation doesn't follow a kind of grammatical unpacking exactly right yeah like, you don't have a conversation in the present is, simple yeah exactly you know Mr. Surting does really Yeah. And you're like, yeah. Oh, he's asking me a uh, person. Now we've got to give it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just no, can't you just have a conversation in the present perfect. It doesn't happen. Exactly right. It yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, you get yeah. you get the odd question here and there. Yeah. 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 And so I think when you sort of understand that, that impacts upon the way you then think about what you're doing in the classroom. Yeah. Um, it took me a while for me to kind of marry up those two, you right. know. What, why am I getting so much better at speaking Indonesian than my students are at speaking English? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, it's because of the input. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Which I suppose, I mean, I'm now immediately thinking everything that we've just said in, uh, kind of echoes back to, I suppose, what the intention must be behind the dogme approach. But I yeah. just, you know, there's, there's got to be why you would yes. want to do something like that. Yes. But uh, it just seems like to me, okay, but you can't call that a course. I, d I don't pretend that I learned Indonesian on a course. I learned it on the street. Uh, yeah. and, and that's okay, but you can't pretend to call it a course, I think. You can't, you know, and you can't pretend it's then it's very different when you've got 10, 12, 15, 20 people in that's the class. That's it, yeah. If you've got a, a yeah. I mean, that's, you, you mentioned, you know, 30 hours. In One to one, great. Minute. Yeah. If you've got half a dozen dedicated learners that you meet a couple of times a week and have a chat with, that's one thing. Yeah. But if you're meeting the same 30 students in a room every day for X number of hours, yeah, no, I, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's far out of that. What room. do you want to talk about today? <laughs> yeah. You tell us, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah that's it. Um, well, sorry, we're, we're exhausted. We've just had a maths exam. That's your that job, is, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your, the lexical lab then. Obviously, it's come up a few times now. But what, I mean, what is it? What are you trying to do with it? And how does it work? So Lexical Lab is a, initially it's a website, so it's www.lexicallab.com. Um, and basically what we do is a range of different things. So we do a lot of blogging there. Um, and we do kind of opinion based blogging about aspects of language teaching. So I've just finished a blog post about 
how I learned to stop asking, is it formal or informal? Because I realized okay. it was a fairly useless question. Okay. Um, we do blogs about language there. So we did a blog about the word lockdown and kind of looking at all the language around talking about lockdown. Okay. Yep. Um, I did another one recently about the idea of being woke and looking at the <laughs> nice. whole language around wokeness and the debate yeah. around woke. And I hope not the, 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 the perfect participle of woke and I hope you didn't go down that <laughs> Well, is so, he woke or is he woke? <laughs> um, the, the, the language-based ones are also come with a set of questions that teachers can just download and use for free. On top of that, we run a six-week summer course in London where we do a two week teaching lexically course. We do three one week advanced language and culture courses. Um, they're really designed for qualified non-native speaker teachers who speak a decent level of English and want okay. to explore particular areas of their teaching without doing a CELTA or something, say. Yeah, right, I see. So we do a one week course on materials development. We have a one week course on testing and assessment. We have another one week course on managing language schools for kind of DOSs or school owners or whatever. Yeah. Um, we then do two week courses on just kind of ironically sort of dog maze style um, okay. language development. So we do mainly advanced level students. We take in topics every day. We work a lot from what the students are saying and reformulate right. and rephrase that stuff. So we do that. Um, yeah. We also do materials development. Um, we do online classes now. So we have a kind of whole online section where we're doing okay. mainly high level once a week language development, intelligent conversation classes. Okay. Um, we do a lot of training overseas, so we go particularly to sort of Russia, Eastern Europe, former sovereign right, countries. Right. Um, happy to go to other places as well if they'd like us to come. Yeah. But we've been doing a lot of kind of training courses and that kind of thing there. Um, and then we have a kind of you know an Instagram page and a YouTube channel and all of that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, okay. Um, all the usual add-ons, yeah, okay. like the Facebook okay. page. Center. Good, good. So oh, the yeah. teaching that you do there, how does that yeah. or does it not at all tie in with like the print books that that you've authored or that you know the publisher that you work Nothing. with? I mean, is this a completely Nothing. separate a separate it's thing? It's a separate thing. It's a separate thing. So I mean, we thought about doing that, but then you know, there's people we work with. For example, there's a, a group based in Russia, but who work with other teachers not from Russia called Teachers Teach Teachers. Okay. And what they do is use outcomes advanced and they teach each other using outcomes advanced and then they give each other feedback on the lessons. And okay. so they do this kind of twin thread of like okay. teacher development and language development through okay. teaching each other. And we just sort of felt like there are people out there already doing this, you know. So right, I see. Yeah, we yeah, we yeah. could do a course where we're using our own course book. But I think also the nature of teaching online where you're teaching one hour a week with one group you basically don't really want to be working through a course book i don't yeah. think you, you want yeah. to basically be doing lots of talking yeah. and have input based on your own output yeah yeah you know, really yeah, yeah. so it, it's yeah. just trying to sort of take advantage of the the affordances of the medium in that kind sure. of sense sure. as well especially if as you've already mentioned if you're working with the higher level students um there comes a point where that is the the logical next step i think right yeah you know, just working from what comes yeah. at you and yeah. saying, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Here's how yeah. I say it. Yeah, right. you know, Doing yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. And that's hard to get. I mean, I don't know what it's like for you with your, with your wife, if she if she actually likes correcting you or, or telling you about your Indonesian. I mean, my yeah, wife just, no, not so much, actually. I'm yeah. not a teacher. Don't ask me. Yeah. But that's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I find, yeah, that's it. I find it very frustrating, actually, because I do some translation work. Um, and so my Indonesian's, you know, it's pretty good um, yeah. but when it comes to translation and and writing uh obviously i've got a long long way to go um yeah. Yeah, and yeah, i find it. it so difficult to find somebody who can tell me exactly what this sentence means or you know it seems to me this sentence is missing something why why they can't tell me why right yeah. and there's not and, and i speak to teachers and i speak to other writers and i, I find it incredibly difficult to find somebody who can really yeah. help me pass a sentence uh, which yeah. of course is the nature of being a native speaker right? yeah 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 so that's what we do all right brilliant
Uh, well, I think we've got it. Is there anything else that you uh, think we've missed or anything else that interests I mean, I'm sure, you? I'm sure there are thousands of things we've missed, but um, yeah. <laughs> it's probably enough for one day. Yeah, I think so, Hugh. All right, well, look, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your time. It was really nice to talk to you, Carl. And apart let me know when you're going to put this up and I'll share it. Yeah, of course I will, yeah. Well. Yeah, please do. And apart from Lexical Lab, is there anything else uh, people should be looking for? Is there anywhere you want to send people? No, just go to the Lexical Lab site and yeah. um, everything we do is there, basically. Great. Yeah. So I'll include links uh, to that on the video and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah. brilliant, Hugh. Thanks a lot. Have a drink and a catch up. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah, right. We'll do definitely. Thanks. Take a lot, care, Carl. Yeah. Yeah, and you too. Bye now. Touch. All right.